says to his son, he says, take my face and place it on the floor. Take my head and take my cheek and place it on the dirt. His son is confused. He says, my father, why? He wants his father to die in his hands. He wants him, this blessed man to die in his hands, to die on his lap. And he says to his son, he said, place my face on the dirt, place my cheek on the dirt, for it may be that Allah, he looks at me in this lowly state and he decides to have pity on his slave. This is a man who's been promised Jannah, but he's talking as if he's the biggest sinner in the world. Yeah, we are the biggest sinners in the world and we talk as if we've got Jannah. Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah amma ba'd Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu Brothers and sisters, how are you doing? Oh, wow, I gave you guys my heart, my emotions, everything You guys mumbled a salam back to me A'udhu billah Listen, we're going to go in inshallah ta'ala The topic I wanted to discuss with you guys today Is based on a topic of being scared where you're going to end up when you die because none of us know what's going to happen with us when we enter into our graves I want to start off by mentioning to you a hadith that Imam Ahmad rahimahullah, he brings in his Muslim the hadith is Sahih in which he mentions that there was a companion of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and this companion was on his deathbed he was on his deathbed and the people came to visit him you know when the scholars they die the knowledge that's with them dies with them as well. So whenever the Sahaba were close to the end of their death, the people would flock to them, waiting, and just, 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 you know, what can I get out of his mouth that can benefit me in terms of knowledge? Because he saw the Prophet, he walked with the Prophet, he studied with the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. When he dies, what he knows about the Prophet is going to die with him. So the people are flocking towards this companion, and when they flocked to him, they found him crying profusely. And they're confused because he is dying, but he's a companion. And we know what's going to happen with the companions of the Prophet They've been already given the pleasure of Allah. Allah said, Allah said that Allah is pleased with them and they're pleased with him. If Allah is pleased with you, what's going to happen to you? You're going to paradise, inshallah. You're going to paradise. So these people have already been told, you're going to go Jannah, basically. Huh? But he's crying. He's crying as if to say, you know, I don't know where I'm going to end up. So they asked him and he said to him, and he mentioned his name, Ya Fulan, oh so and so, you accompany the Prophet. You're a companion. Allah is pleased with you. What are you scared of? Why are you crying? And he said, I'm crying because I heard the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam say, <coughs> that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took the humans, he took the creation and he divided them into two categories and then with one category Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said these are the ones who are going to go to Jannah then another category, the other half Allah said that these are the ones who are going to go to hellfire the point here is that where we are going to end up has already been decreed brothers and sisters so he said, I am crying because I don't know if it's written for me to go Jannah or if it's written for me to go Jannah. Brothers and sisters, this is a very deep point. If only you ponder. Imam Rajab ibn Hanbali rahimahullah, and remember this because this is one of the questions. Imam Rajab ibn Hanbali rahimahullah, he used to say there was nothing that would make the Salaf al Salihin, the Sahaba, and the students of the Sahaba, and their students cry. There's nothing that would bring them more fear. There's nothing that would bring them more distress and stress and, and, and sorrow and sadness than this right here. The fact that they're walking on this earth and they don't know what has already been decreed about them. It's already written if they're in Jannah. It's already written if they're in Jahannam. You might be laughing and joking, my brothers. Sisters, you might be chilling and hanging out, having a good time, wasting time, but you don't realize maybe it's written for you to enter hell. Do you really have time to sit around and joke? You need to make the most of this opportunity at hand. How are you so comfortable as if to say you've already been given Jannah? In my country, we speak Urdu, we have a saying. You know, if you say to someone, Akhi, fear Allah, stop doing this haram. He'll say to you, 
Allah ka fazl hai, which in Arabic means fadlullah, like this is from the fadl of Allah, the virtue of Allah. He said, Allah, Allah ka fazl hai. I mean, I've got virtue from Allah. So I'm a Muslim, I do this, I do that. You got, you got virtue? You got fazl? Like, you're, 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 you're so relaxed? Like, you're relaxed? The Prophet ﷺ himself wasn't relaxed. The Prophet's been granted Jannah. Not just Jannah. Maqamun Mahdoo Mahmooda. The Prophet's been given the greatest, highest station in paradise. Already, the Prophet ﷺ was raised above the heavens to the highest point. That no one from creation has ever gone that high to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But he did not see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But he went as high as he could. Allah took him. Yet him with all of that nobility and all of that virtue and all of the verses in the Quran that are praising him and all the hadith that we know the virtues of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi in the next life he was still scared of the punishment of Allah how are me and you not scared of the punishment of Allah? Aisha radiallahu anha narrated and the hadith is in Sahih Bukhari, Sahih Muslim and it's also in other places but Sahih Hain suffices us where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa she said one time he saw a cloud he saw a cloud, a very big thick cloud now when you know a cloud is approaching what do you know straight away? It's going to, it's going to rain. When you're in the desert and a cloud approaches you, this is a situation in which you rejoice. Because when you're in the desert, you're dying of thirst. Your plants don't grow. The food that you eat that comes from the ground, it doesn't grow. Your animals die because there's no water for them to drink. When there's no water for them to drink, there's no water to come down, there's no vegetation, which means there's no food for you to eat. That means you're going to die as well. The heat is a lot. So every now and again, when the rain comes, the people, they rejoice. It's a time to be happy. It's a mercy from the mercies of Allah. It's a blessing from the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, you would expect the Prophet is going to be happy seeing this massive cloud that Allah is going to rain down his rahmah upon us. Huh? But then Aisha radiallahu anha said that when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saw the cloud, his face changed. It changed and you could see distress and sorrow on his face. And she said, Ya Rasulullah, the people they rejoice when the, when, the, when the clouds come because the mercy of Allah is going to rain down upon us. Yet we can see your distress. What is it that is distressing you? And the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, he said, Ya Aisha. He said, Oh Aisha, who is going to save God and protect me from the punishment of Allah? There was a people, the Prophet said, that when they saw this, they also thought that the blessing and the mercy of Allah was going to come. But it was a punishment from Allah that destroyed them. The people of Nuh alayhi salam, what were they destroyed by? They were destroyed by what? They were destroyed by water. The water rained down so much it flooded the whole world. And they were all killed. That was a punishment from Allah. That same thing which is from the blessings of Allah, it can become a punishment from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala very quickly. The people of Ra'ad, they were destroyed by what? A wind. A wind is something nice, a nice breeze on a hot summer's day. But that wind, it destroyed them. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa is not finding safety from the punishment of Allah. When he's best placed to find safety from the punishment of Allah. Yet he is still saying, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he may, he may, I'm, I'm, he's not saying he may, but he's saying who will save me from the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Sahaba were like this. The Sahaba used to walk the face of this earth and they were promised Jannah. There were 10 companions who the Prophet mentioned by name in one hadith and said, all of them are promised Jannah. From them was Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu. Ya Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu used to lament and he used to show sorrow and he used to say, I wish, he used to say, I wish I was just a hair on the chest of Abu Bakr. Look at that. Him and Abu Bakr are promised Jannah. Yet he knows Abu Bakr is greater than him. Look how he's belittling himself. He is the second greatest man from this ummah after the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Yet he's saying, I wish I was just a hair on the chest of Abu Bakr. Why? Because that hair is not going to be held accountable on the day of judgment. That hair will not be questioned by Allah on the day of judgment. Brothers and sisters, ayat from the Quran came down in agreement with Umar. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala defended Umar in the Quran radiallahu anhu. He is from those, has virtue upon virtue, yet he is scared because he doesn't know if he's done enough. If he doesn't know he's done enough, what about us? Huh? Brothers and sisters, when Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu was dying, he, his head, 
his son Abdullah ibn Umar placed his head on his, on his lap. He took his father's head and he placed it on his lap. And Umar is dying. You want to die in your loved one's arms, huh? You want to die in your loved one's lap, in their comfort, in the custody uh, of your loved ones. But what does he say? He says to his son, he says, take my face and place it on the floor. Take my head and take my cheek and place it on the dirt. His son is confused. He said, my father, why? He wants his father to die in his hands. He wants him, this blessed man to die in his hands, to die on his lap. And he says to his son, he said, place my face on the dirt, place my cheek on the dirt, for it may be that Allah, he looks at me in this lowly state and he decides to have pity on his slave. This is a man who's been promised Jannah, but he's talking as if he's the biggest sinner in the world. Yeah, we are the biggest sinners in the world and we talk as if we've got Jannah. Uthman radiallahu anhu was another one who was promised Jannah. He was from the top 10. He's the third greatest Sahabi after, uh, from the Sahaba. He was not only just promised Jannah, but he was so noble that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam married two of his daughters to him. He married one daughter, that daughter died. And then he married another daughter to him. And he said, if I had, if I'm not mistaken, a hundred daughters, I would have married them all to Uthman. If all of them died one by one, I would have kept going back to this man because there's no one more worthy of marrying my daughters than this noble man right here. He was the man that the Prophet was shy of. And he said, I'm shy of him because the angels are shy of him. And if only you know how shy the angels are. <coughs> Yet he did not find safety from the punishment of Allah every time he would walk past Jannatul Baqi, which is the graveyard in Medina in which the Sahaba are buried. And remember, he would probably walk past there every day because him being the Khalifa of the Muslims, he would lead the prayer. If you've ever gone to Medina, who's gone to Medina? Put your hands up. You go to Medina, you know that here's the masjid. The mihrab is here. The moment you come out of the masjid, you see the graveyard on your left. So every time he comes in and out of the masjid, five times a day, he's probably walking past that graveyard. And it was narrated that every single time he would walk past the graveyard, without fail, he would cry so much tears that his beard would become drenched and soaked with them. And he would ask, why? Why do you cry when you walk past the graveyard? And he would say, I cry because the messenger told me that this is the beginning of the day of judgment. That if a person passes the test in the grave, then that person has passed everything. But if you fail the test in the grave, you failed everything else. He never found safety from the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Abu Ubaidah ibn Jarrah radiallahu anhu, brothers and sisters, another companion of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, again promised Jannah. And he was given the title, he was the Ameen of this Ummah. The Ameen of this Ummah. The Prophet said, every nation has an Ameen. And he is the Ameen of this Ummah. He was the one that Umar ibn Khattab chose to be the general of the Muslims after Khalid ibn Walid. He took Khalid ibn Walid, the great general of Islam. He took him down and he said, Abu Ubaid ibn Jarrah is going to take his position. And he's going to lead the Muslim army in Sham. He's going to lead the Muslim army against the Romans. That was his great noble companion. Walking on the face of this earth, knowing he was promised paradise. But how was he? He used to say, I wish I was just a lamb. I wish I was just a lamb. And I was slaughtered. And my meat was distributed amongst the people. Why is he saying this? Because a lamb, a lamb, is not going to be questioned by Allah on the day of judgment. Yet he has been promised Jannah, brothers and sisters, I can go on. I can give you the example of Mu'ad ibn Jabir. This is not something rare. This is not like, this is how the Sahaba, you know, one or two. No, this is the Sahaba, how all of them pretty much were. Mu'ad ibn Jabir radiallahu an, on his deathbed, he is dying. Do you know who Mu'ad was? Do you know who Mu'ad was? They said about him, he is the most knowledgeable in the ummah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa after the Prophet of course, in terms of the halal and the haram. He was a scholar of this ummah. Not just that, he earned the status of being the beloved of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Prophet loves all of the Muslims. Like in the Prophet said to, be, he said to Mu'ad directly, he said, Wallahi, I love you Mu'ad. And he said it again, Wallahi, I love you Mu'ad. And the third time the Prophet said, Wallahi, I love you Mu'ad. And we can go on and on talking about his virtues. This noble companion on his deathbed, he is dying and it is night time. And around him are his companions, his students, his close ones, his loved ones are around him. And he is scared. He's petrified. He's disturbed. 
and he's saying to his companions, go out and look, go outside, go outside of the house and look, has the morning come yet? Has the morning come yet? And they would come back and say, no, the morning hasn't come. And then some time would pass and he would come back out and he would say, has the morning come yet? Go out and look. They would come back and say, the morning is not here. Some time would pass and he would ask again, very anxious, very, very anxious. He's got anxiety. Something's up with the morning. What's wrong with the morning? Why is he so concerned with the morning? They asked him, what's up, what's up? Why do you want the morning, Ya Mu'ad? And he said, the reason I'm worried is because I feel that this morning, I'm scared that this morning might be a morning in which it will be my direction into the hellfire. Are you hearing me? He's saying, because you understand, he's going to die. So he's saying, if I, I feel like I might die in the morning. I'm about to die any minute. The morning, I don't feel like I'll make it past the morning. And he's saying, I'm scared I might be burning in a hellfire. Brothers and sisters, this is a believer. The Prophet said, I love you. He's scared. What are we doing? What are we doing? Huh? Boys talking to girls, girls talking to boys. You're praying, okay, mashallah, that's good. But you think that's enough? Let's have a reality check for a second. You think that's enough? Sufyan al-Thawri, rahimullah, was on his deathbed. Sufyan al-Thawri, rahimullah, was on his deathbed. And they came to him. He was a great noble scholar. And the students were the students of the Sahaba. And he said to him, they noticed him crying. Crying his eyes out. This man prayed Qiyamul Layl for 20 years straight. Without his wife, without, you know what he used to do? He used to wake up early. He used to wake up early and pray Qiyamul Layl, the night prayer, the tahajjud prayer, when everyone's asleep, everyone's with their loved ones, or they're out night partying, raving, doing whatever. Boys are talking to their girlfriends on the phone, praying through their. Uh, you know, their, their Instagrams and DMing them and whatnot. That's what we would do at night, right? Watching filthy things on the internet. That's what we do at night, right? But he used to wake up early and pray the night prayer. And when he would do that, he would then go back into the bed, pretend like he just woke up and wake his wife up and say, let's pray. Because Allah said, command your family to pray. Command your family members to pray. So he would wake his wife up. But why would, he, why would he pray before? The reason he's praying before is because he doesn't want it to mess with his intentions. He wants this to be a secret between him and Allah that I'm worshipping my Lord and no one else knows about this. Just my Lord knows that I'm worshipping him. He didn't even want his wife to know. But the one who told us about this was his wife. She narrated that she did know. But because she was a loving wife and she was concerned because she knew that if I let him know that I know he's getting up early, he would go even harder and push his body even harder to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I pretended as well as if I didn't know. And then they would get up and they would pray. Why am I telling you this? So you can know the status of this great noble imam. That's who he was. And then he was a scholar of the religion. And he was a zahid, okay? He even had his own madhab, but he didn't have students that brought it out. But the point is, he was a great noble imam. When he was on his deathbed, brothers and sisters, he was crying, crying like a child, crying like a person that's done so many sins that now he's going to stand before his Lord and he's come with so many sins, maybe murder, zina, all these sorts of sins. He's crying in that way. So the people around him and they say, Ya Sufyan, uh, are you crying? Abu, 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 Abu Abdullah, because that was his kunya. He said, Abu Abdullah, are you crying? Because you've done so many sins. Are you crying because you've sins, you're remembering your sins? And he said to them, he said, listen, because I'm not concerned about my sins. He picked up a twig from the ground and he said, my sins are important to me as this twig is right here. That's how significant my sins are to me. But then he began to cry even harder because he's now about to tell them exactly what he's scared of. But before he tells them, the thought of him telling them and the thought of that reality scaring him so much, he burst into tears one more time. And then he finally works up the strength to say, the reason I'm crying is because I'm scared that, my, that the Iman, that the belief in Allah is going to be ripped and stripped away from me just moments before my death. Just moments before my death, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to take my Iman away. This man is a scholar his whole life, brothers and sisters. He's been a scholar his whole life, huh? Not his whole life, but the majority of his life. He's praying 20 years straight. Yet he's saying, I believe Iman might be stripped away from me. And we, we, we're not scared. We're not scared. 
I have so many examples, but time is coming to the end. So inshallah ta'ala, I want to sum up and give you guys two practical advices. What can you do, brothers and sisters, to ensure that when you die, you're going to be in a good place? The first thing, my beloved brothers and sisters, is that you make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That you make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who's in control. He is the one who guides and he is the one who prevents guidance from people. He is the one who guides and he is the one who prevents guidance from people. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَلَكِنَّ Allah, Rather, it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, يَهْدِيهِ مَنْ يَشَاءُ Allah guides whom he wills. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa told us that the hearts of the, of the believers are between the fingers of Ar-Rahman, between the fingers of Allah, and he tosses and turns the heart how he wills. One day you're practicing, and the next day you fall off the deen. One day you're practicing, and the next day you slip up. One day you're not practicing, suddenly you're practicing. Allah, he tossed your heart. So if Allah is in control of your heart, then it only makes sense that you make dua. Wallahi, brothers and sisters, have you ever pondered why, why we were told every day, 17 times a day at minimum, because of the five daily prayers, to say, إِهْدِنَا الصِّرَاطِ mustaqim. Say, Allah, guide me to the straight path. Guide us rather to the straight path. Why? Because there's no other better thing to make dua for than this. Imam Ibn Taymiyyah rahimullah said that if there was a better dua for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for us to ask him, Allah would have told us to make that dua in our prayers. But there's no better dua than guidance. Don't think that just because you're a Muslim you're guided. Imam Ibn Rajab al hanbali rahimahullah, he mentioned hidayah, guidance is of two types. There's guidance from kufr to al-Islam. And there's guidance in Islam towards the deep intricacies of the religion. Towards the deep intricacies of the religion. So just because you become a Muslim, the game's not over. What's stopping you from becoming a mu'min or a mu'mina to go up those levels? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa was he guided? Was the Prophet guided? I'm asking the question, was he guided? He was the most guided. Yet every night the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would stand up. You know the night prayer where I told you the Prophet was standing up and he was praying? Every night, you know what dua he would make every night? We say, Allahumma Rabba Jibra'il, wa Mika'il, wa Israfil, Fatir al Samawati wal Ard, Ali Mulhaibi wa Shahada, Anta Tahkuma Baina Ibadika Fima Kanu Fihi Akhtarifun, Ihdini, Li Makhtuli Fafihim in Al Haki Bi Idni. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Make this big dua, O oh Allah, the Lord of the Angel Jibra'il, the Lord of the Angel Mika'il, wa Israfil, and then he would praise Allah, and then he would say, Guy. The Prophet would say, guide me. He would say, guide me. So how are me and you not getting up at night? Not getting up at night and asking Allah Azza wa Jal for guidance. And this is something common. Even Ibrahim alayhi salam, who destroyed the idols with his own hands. He said, my Lord. He said, Rabbi. Janubini wa baniya. He said, divert me and my children from what? From worshipping Aslam. And al-Aslam, divert me and my children and myself from worshipping idols. If I point, if I ask any one of these children here, these kids, what is shirk? They're gonna to point to an idol of Ganesh or Hanuman or something like that, which is the Hindu gods. Because that's the idols are the most clearest shirk. He's saying, Allah, divert me from that. Take me away from that. And he's a prophet who used to destroy those idols as a child with his bare hands. So that's the first practical thing, brothers and sisters, is that I want you all to beg Allah for guidance. You can use the dua that I just mentioned right now. You can say, Ya Muqallib al Qulub Thabbit Qalbi ala Deenik. You can make all these other duas, so many other duas. You can make so many other duas, duas for guidance. But the main one is the one in the salah. Ihdina sirat al mustaqim. Allah guide us to the right path. Finally, brothers and sisters, the second practical step is to seek knowledge. Because knowledge is guidance it's not enough for you to just ask you have to practically do it a man can all day all day all day beg Allah Allah give me risk Allah give me risk but he doesn't even try to go out there and work is he going to get risk that's not how it works that's not the sunnah of Allah you have to make dua and beg do you know what tawakkul is tawakkul doesn't mean that you rely upon Allah and you don't put the effort in nor does it mean that you put the effort in and don't rely upon Allah but tawakkul means that you exhaust every single possible avenue in trying to do this thing that you're trying to do. Yet even though you put all your energy and all your efforts into it, you still know that this cannot happen without Allah. That means tawakkul. That means reliance upon Allah. So you can beg and beg and beg. You have to beg. But 
you have to exhaust every possible avenue yourself to try and attain that guidance, knowing that it will only come when Allah gives you the ability and the tawfiq for that to happen. So brothers, do that. Sisters, do that. And what is the evidence that guidance is knowledge? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, هُوَ الَّذِي أَرْسَلَ رَسُولَهُ بِالْهُدَى وَدِينِ الْحَقِّ Go and look at the tafsir. Open up tafsir bin Kathir. Go open up the tafsir of the mufassirin who did tafsir bin Athar. Okay, tafsir of the Sunnah of the Prophet and the way it should be done. And you will find them. Whenever it comes to this ayah, they will say, when Allah said, Allah sent the Prophet with guidance, bil huda, the guidance here is beneficial knowledge. Wadeen al haq is righteous actions. So the knowledge and to implement it. So study, seek knowledge of what? Three things. Quran was Sunnah. But there's a third thing. And the third thing is the one that I really want to emphasize to you guys because no one is going to dispute that I need to follow the Quran and no one's going to dispute that I need to follow the Sunnah and I need to study the Sunnah. But the third one is what we dispute and that is to study the, the religion according to the Salaf, the Salaf of Salihin. Who are the Salaf of Salihin? Sahaba, the students of the Sahaba and the students of the students of the Sahaba up until the time of Imam al-Bukhari. So you can take it from Abu Bakr radiallahu an to about the time of Imam al-Bukhari. That's a Sahaba. Why should we study the religion according to them? Because they are the ones who the Prophet sallallahu told us they're the best of people. He said the best of people is my people. Khairun nas qadni qadni is my generation. And then the ones after that. And then the ones after that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Tawbah ayah number 100. What did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say? That the right at the top of the list are who? The Sahaba. Al-Muhajir wal Ansar. وَالَّذِينَ تَبَعُوهُمْ بِإِحْسَانٍ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنْهُمْ وَرَضُوا عَنْهُ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then after mentioning the Sahaba said that those who follow the Sahaba and when they follow them in good then Allah will be pleased with you Allah will not be pleased with you unless you follow the Sahaba and then Allah said Allah will give you Jannah then Allah will take you into paradise why? because you follow the Sahaba in another ayah Allah told you in Surah An-Nisa وَمَنْ يُشَاقِقِ الرَّسُولِ مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا تَبَيَّنَ لَهُ الْهُدَى وَيَتَّبِئْ غَيْرَ سَبِيلِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said if anyone opposes the path of the Prophet and the Sahaba because the believers in the ayah what Allah is talking about the only believers at that time were the Sahaba so anyone who opposes the path of the Sahaba and the path of the Prophet Allah said وَنُسْ لِهِ جَهَنَّمِ is going to be dragged and taken to the hellfire so you might be studying Quran and you might be studying Sunnah but that's not, not, not enough for you to be guided because the Shia is going to come and say I follow Quran the Barelvi Sufi is going to come and say I follow Quran and Sunnah they're all going to say that to you the Ikhwanis are going to say I follow Quran and Sunnah right? how many people ISIS will tell you I follow Quran and Sunnah but everyone falls wrong on the Sahaba the Sahaba knew the religion better than anyone else so it makes sense that we learn the religion from the Sahaba and sorry I should have translated Sahaba means companions companions of the Prophet that's what I'm talking about when I say the Sahaba if you do these two things my beloved brothers and sisters then inshallah ta'ala you'll be guided and you'll be with the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam after you die after you die that is to beg Allah and make dua for guidance and also also what to seek knowledge brothers and sisters finally I just going to mention the statement of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam too and then I'm going to go because I want to leave you with a bit of hope I'm going to leave you with a, with, a, with, a, with a bit of hope okay we shouldn't just leave it at fear and have you guys thinking this is game over for me the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said the hadith is narrated by Abdullah ibn Sa'ud radiallahu anhu where the Prophet said فَوَالَّذِي لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا غَيْرُهُ the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam took a oath he took a qasim he said I swear by the one there is no one worthy to be worshipped other than him in truth the Prophet ﷺ didn't need to take the oath. We would have believed him anyway, but he still took the oath anyway. And what did he say? Inna ahadakum la ya'malu bi amali ahl al-janna hatta ma yakunu bainahu wa bainaha illa dhira' fa yasbiqu alayhi al-kitab fa ya'malu bi amali ahl al-nar fa yadkhuluha. The Prophet ﷺ said that I swear by Allah, one of you is going to be doing the actions from the people of Jannah. People of Jannah, you're going to be doing what they do. They, they wear the hijab and they wear the niqab and they cover up and they pray and they do all these good things. They give charity, right? They do da'wah, they do all these good things. You're going to be doing those actions. But suddenly, the decree of Allah will overcome you. And what are you going to do? You're going to start to do the actions of the people of the hellfire. But look, look what the Prophet said. You're going to be doing so much actions of the people of Jannah that you're basically going to be so close to Jannah. Just one hand spanned away. That's how close to Jannah you're going to be. But just be, like you were just about to die. And if you died, you would have been dying on the actions of the people of Jannah. But you started to do kufr. You started to do sins. You started to disobey Allah. You'll be judged on by what you died. That's why the Prophet said, You're going to go Jahannam now. I'm going to go Jahannam if I do that. May Allah protect each and every single one of us. And then the Prophet said, 
the Prophet said, one of you is going to be doing the actions of the people of hellfire. And how many of us, let's not be around a bush, how many of us are doing actions for the people of hellfire? Free mixing, talking to girls, talking to guys, fornicating, watching filthy things online that we shouldn't, disobeying, disrespecting our parents, missing praise, listening to music, doing bid'ah, doing all sorts of things, backbiting, lying. All of these things, I can go on and every single one of us in the room is guilty of so many of these sins. So this hadith applies to us right now. Pay attention and listen attentively. The Prophet said, one of you might be doing the actions of the people of hellfire. So much so that you've done so much actions to the people of hellfire that you're so close to the hellfire that you're literally about to fall into it. Just a hand span away. And the Prophet said, kitab. Suddenly you change your life. Suddenly you start doing actions to the people of Jannah. Suddenly you start doing actions to the people of Jannah. And what happens? Allah enters you into paradise. Allah enters you into paradise. Brothers and sisters, you know what this shows us? It's not about how you started the race. It's about how you finish it. It's about how you die. Forget all of the sins that you've done in the past. Allah will forgive you if you repent sincerely. Today make change. I beg you. Make change today. Stop begging Allah for guidance. Start seeking knowledge and implementing that knowledge. Praying Allah, worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone upon the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in accordance to the manhaj and the methodology of his companions. Radiyallahu anhum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.